Good morning. It's a blessing to be with you here this morning. I've been going through a, a series of messages that I entitled Learning from Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm just really blessed studying the life of Jesus. I know sometimes we, as we study the life of Jesus, we, we focus a lot on his teaching. And for the purpose of this series, uh, I'd like to spend most of the time focusing on his example. Um, so, especially in how he relates to people around him and in his actions. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12, we're told to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so, uh, I think it's very fitting for us in our day to look at Jesus' example and to learn from him. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to start at verse 13. Matthew 14, starting at verse 13. It says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, and he said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children." One of the first things that we learn in this example, you know what, many of you have grown up with this story, and there's so much in it that maybe you ask yourself again, why am I going through that again? I, it's so familiar to me. But there's some great truth that I believe um, you ought to take a second look at this morning. And so look at verse 13. We're going to start, and we're just going to go through this passage. Verse 13 it says, now when Jesus heard this, what, what did he just hear? If you look at a few verses prior to this, you'll see that a report had come his way that John the Baptist had been beheaded. John the Baptist was the forerunner to Christ. He, he was um, also related to Jesus. Um, he was the cousin of Jesus. And so... When Jesus heard this, it says he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. One of the, the, the great things I see here is just the, this, this reminder, as we look at the example of Jesus... He put the needs of other people in front of him, himself. I know that that's not easy to do. And often in our life, we get interrupted. We get inconvenienced. Things change in our day, in our schedule. One of the things I, I appreciate about Jesus is instead of resenting the inconvenience, of the crowds, he looks upon them with compassion. This is an interesting perspective. Sometimes, maybe it's selfish, maybe it's not, but I, I think from time to time we all appreciate time away. We like moments where we can tell people, this is my day off, this is me time. I'm going out by myself, I hope nobody interrupts me. I hope nobody calls me or talks to me or knocks on my door and wants to come visit me. Um, you know, we have moments like that in our lives, right, where 
where we also want to draw away to a desolate place. Well, if you think of the heart of Jesus, he, he wanted to spend some time by himself. So he goes to a desolate place, maybe to mourn what happened to John the Baptist, maybe to spend some time in meditation about that. But he was not able to do that, was he? The crowds all of a sudden caught wind where he was going, and they follow him. But instead of resenting it, he puts their needs ahead of his own. To me, this is a, a, was a real eye-opener again for me to remind me that I'm not here in this world for self. You know, when Jesus saves us, he doesn't just save us so that we can enjoy life and, and, and kick back in an easy chair and not do anything anymore. He saves us for a purpose. And one of those purposes is to meet the needs of the people that he sends our way. And Jesus demonstrates that beautifully. I know sometimes we might be tempted to say to these situations, not right now, oh, I'm busy. Can it be something else? One of the, the um, events that, that I know God has ha had to teach me about being blessings is things like funerals. Um, funerals often completely throw off my schedule for the entire week. You know, we, we had a funeral here on Tuesday. And, and it, it just changes everything. Because now, now I was prepping for a, a Sunday sermon. I was prepping for a wedding yesterday and dealing with a funeral. You know, and, and it was, and it's a blessing to be able to do that. But something that God has taught me, and, and I'm, I'm still learning, I'm, I'm still needing more refinement, is when that phone call comes to, to recognize that, that this is from the Lord and, and that my whole week is going to look different. But that's okay. Some of the greatest inconveniences in our lives turn out to be the greatest blessings. But our heart has to change. We have to be willing when somebody knocks on the door to say, okay, Lord, I was about to go away with my family for the day, but somebody's in need. And I, I realize that there's moments where, where we ought to shut everything off and, and spend a time um, away with our family and that kind of thing. But we also need to be very okay with God sending people our way. Whether it's a phone call, whether it's somebody that, that calls and says, hey, can we come over? We need help. You know, we, we need to be willing to look at Jesus' response. I mean, he could have shut out the crowds, right? He could have said, no, this is me time, and told his disciples, send the crowds away. But he doesn't do that. Rather, he looks upon the people, and he looks upon them with compassion. And so I think one of the things that, that I believe God is teaching us here in this passage is that sometimes serving in the kingdom of God is inconvenient, but it means we need to put self aside. If we want to become more like Jesus in our lives, we need to be willing to say, you know what, maybe that was what I had planned, but God had different plans for me. And so that means serving Christ sometimes costs. In verse uh, 14 here, as we continue through this passage, it says, He saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. This word saw is the same word that we see in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, which says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Sometimes when we are out and about, and our focus is not on the kingdom of God, our, our vision can be flawed. Our vision can be self-focused. And maybe sometimes when you're in a crowded spot, maybe all you see are the masses of humanity. Maybe you just see a crowd. Well, the disciples seem to be like that in this illustration. The disciples looked upon the crowd and they said to Jesus, send them back to the villages to buy food. 
But Jesus, it says Jesus saw them too. But his, his vision was a little bit different, wasn't it? Do you ever ask God to give you the kind of vision that Jesus has? I wonder what would change in our world if we got up in the morning and we said, Lord, would you help me to see people the way you see them today? Maybe instead of seeing just the faces of humanity, maybe then we would see the pain, the grief, the sadness, the hurt, the, the loneliness, the fear, the anxieties, the stress. Maybe we would start to see people the way Jesus seen them. It says here, he's seen them as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. You know, we, we need the vision of Christ if we want to demonstrate the compassion of Christ to people. The uh, songwriter um, says this so well. He says, Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the brokenhearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach, Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. And, and further on in his song, as, as he's praying this, he writes this. I step out on the busy street. I see a girl and our eyes meet. Does her best to smile at me to hide what's underneath. There's a man just to her right, black suit and a bright red tie, too ashamed to tell his wife he's out of work, he's buying time. All these people are going somewhere. Why have I never cared? You know, something changes in us when we start to see people the way Jesus sees them. And, and the songwriter says, all these people are going somewhere, why, why have I never cared? Maybe because I wasn't looking at them like Jesus looks at them. You know, if we don't have a Christ-like vision for people, we will be like the disciples and we will say, oh, send them to the village to buy food. That's why we need a heavenly vision. And we need to, to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be an instrument in your hands. Help me to see people the way you see them. Give me a new perspective. Let's look at verse 15 there. It says, Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place. This was a place out in the wilderness. There was no stores. There was no restaurants. There was nothing like that. There's, they say, This is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But, remember we're looking at Jesus' example. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. I love that thought. I wonder sometimes when we think about our influence in the world, maybe we hate to be inconvenienced. Maybe we wish nobody would contact us and leave us alone and we could just live our own life without people disturbing us. And maybe all of that is because we don't have that vision that Jesus had here. But I wonder sometimes, how many people have we sent off into the villages to buy food? Do you ever think about that? How often is our attitude like that of the disciples? Oh, you know, I should just send them away. I wish they wouldn't call me. I wish they wouldn't bother me. Sometimes we look at our call display and somebody's calling and we're like, you know, I'm just going to let voicemail get that. I, I can't deal with that guy and his problems. I can't deal with her. Like, Man, she's going to just go on and on again about all the issues in her life. 
And, and we live our life like that and we, we turn people away that are looking for food. And we send them back to the villages. Maybe back, maybe we could equate that with the bars and the things of this world. The, the party scene. Because, let's face it, we live in a world of darkness where people are missing out on peace and joy and are looking for something. I mean, you can almost audibly feel when you head out into the town sometimes and you, you just watch people and observe them. You, you sometimes get an ache, right? I don't know if you do. But you just kind of realize here's a people that is without joy and full of stress and anxiety and sadness. And, you know, they're, they're out in the villages buying food. And sometimes our actions send them there. Sometimes our complacency sends them there. Sometimes it's our lack of compassion that sends them there. And Jesus says here, they need not go away. They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Let me say this to you. If Jesus has opened up your eyes and you're sitting here today and you're a born-again child of God and the seed is growing inside of you, you have something to offer humanity. You have a choice on a daily basis as you encounter people to feed them from the living bread. Or you can send them off into the village. And Jesus says, you need not go away. And I, I hope that, that you guys understand that. That we have a responsibility. As saved followers of Jesus, we have a responsibility. And I think if Jesus was here today, he would say, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. W.A. Criswell, who was a, a minister in the 1930s, preached over 50,000 sermons in his lifetime. He um, was a Southern Baptist preacher. He, he writes this um, in his commentary. He says, There was a cartoon published in a newspaper how effective it was, a little island, and on the island, or on the inside of the little island, a little group of people with their faces turned inward. And a sea was around the island. There was no caption, he says, nothing but just that. He says, it would attract your attention if for no other reason, because you wondered, well, what should such a thing mean? But when you look closely, he says, the sea was a sea of humanity. So there was a sea of humanity surrounding a little island, and the people on the island all had their faces turned away from the sea, is what he's saying. He says, the little inlets to the island were long, stark, emaciated, and bony hands reaching up to the people in the island. But these in the island were faced inward with their backs turned to the vast sea of starving humanity. And he says, how easy it is for us in our abundance, in our affluence, to close our eyes to the vast multitudes on any mission field and say, send them away. Send them away. Forget them. What a blessedness, he says, when the Lord can open the eyes of his people, can open the eyes of his church, can open the eyes of these who love and serve in his name, and wherever there is somebody that needs God, there has God called us to preach and to minister and to serve and to teach. And he goes on to say, I couldn't think of a finer thing to put over the portals of a church door than that you need not go away. You need not go away. You know, I, I pray that 
as God's people here in the church, that that could be our mantra. That could be our slogan. That we could have above our door, you need not go away. You need not go to the villages to buy food. Find your sustenance here. I want to feed you by the grace given to me. It's a change of heart. You know what? The, the, the harvest fields are ripe. I don't know if you've noticed, but we live in a world where people are wringing their hands as they worry about the future. They're filled with anxiety. But inside us, as born-again children of God, God has given us an answer. Let's not send them away. Let's, let's be deliberate. You ought not to go back into the villages to buy food. May you find provision here. May you find sustenance here to feed you. In verse 17, we read here, they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Somebody has said this. If you leave Jesus out of your calculations, you will come up short every time. We, we live our, our lives far too often like these disciples. And we, we look in front of us and all we see is five loaves and two fish. And we forget, just like the disciples did, that their greatest resource was sitting right in the middle of them. You know, God has given us so many opportunities to serve Him. But it's our short-sightedness, right, that often gets in the way. I want to share with you a little thought here. Um, Joseph Parker was a preacher in the 1800s who lived uh, around the same era as Charles Spurgeon. Um, and I think his, his church was called the, the City Temple or something like that. I've really come to appreciate his words. Um, on a Sunday, I think he had about two different services. In each service, there were about 3,000 people that would come in just to, to hear him preach. And he shares this in one of his messages about this passage. And he says, Give me the inventory of their property, will you? It will then read thus. We have here but five loaves and two fishes, and God, and Christ, and the miracle worker, and the creator. What poor inventories we return, he says. The stationer could give us paper enough for inventories, 10,000 times over, we give the material side only when we add up our riches. We put down the loaves and the fishes and the water and the gold and the silver and the stones. But what about ideas, impulses, thoughts and purposes, burning desires, imperishable capacities? What about the immortality that stirs within us? With such omissions, your inventory is not worth the paper it is written upon. He says, when you reckon up your little stock tonight, do not forget to add at the end of the foot of the roll, and Christ, and Providence, and my Father in heaven, and you will lay down your weary head as a millionaire, multiplied by innumerable millions as to store in value. I love that thought. You know, how often... Don't we look at ourselves and we say, oh, but I'm not gifted. Oh, but I, I don't have an answer. I'm not equipped. I can't do what the next guy or gal can do. How often don't we sell ourselves short because just like the disciples, we look just at the five loaves and the two fish. 
And as we look at the five loaves and the two fish, we forget to add Jesus to the calculation. And if we forget to add Jesus to the calculation, guess what? We will come short every single time. When you add Jesus to the equation, everything changes. Everything changes. Suddenly, it's not just five loaves and two fishes. Suddenly, it's five loaves, two fishes, and the creator of the universe. And then you start to realize, oh, I am rich. I have all kinds of resources here. And you know what? When you have that kind of mentality, it changes your life. Don't stop short of just looking at what's in front of you. I think so many times we forget what Jesus said. Bring them here to me. Bring them here to me. And I wonder if you look at your life today and you think, you know, I haven't been very faithful or fruitful in the kingdom of God. I wonder when I stand before him how much is going to be left after the fire has burned away the dross. And I would encourage you today, bring them to Jesus. Bring your gifts to Jesus. Bring your talents to Jesus. And all of a sudden, you'll see you have far more than five loaves and two fish. I was reminded of what we had done years ago um, here at church. Because recently, even as a, as a pastoral team here, we get together every Wednesday, um, Helen and I and Pete and Lisa Clausen, and we... We talk about the different needs in the church and, and how we can be effective in serving in ministry. And it came to us recently again, have we forgotten that God is on our side? And, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I love some of the fundraisers that we've done here. And I think a school, because it's privately funded, has to get involved in fundraisers. But I was reminded of years ago at Houghton Center Gospel Church, before we moved here, um, we had close to 300 people gathering on Sunday mornings there. And, and we had no more room. We filled up the basement. We filled up the sanctuary. We filled up the upstairs. We filled up the foyer. Um, it, just, it just didn't work anymore. And so we started to seek God about a building, but we didn't have resources. We didn't have the funds. And so we did a special offering one Sunday to start the ball rolling. In that special offering, $10,000 came together. And back then, um, over 20 years ago, that was a bigger amount. Uh, you know, it, it was a good size. We were really excited about this $10,000. We, we ended up taking this $10,000 and we put it on a table in front of the church and Pastor Henry prayed and, and I was reminded of that in this passage here. Instead of just seeing $10,000, instead of just seeing the five loaves and the two fish, we cried out to God. We said, God, would you take this and multiply it? In a sense, we, we brought the, these things to Jesus. And we said, Lord, if we look upon our own understanding, it looks like an impossibility. I mean, we have this little building to sell way out in the boonies. Who's even going to want this building? And, and so we were a little bit like the disciples. And yet there was a, a, a grain of mustard seed faith there where we said, Lord, you are able to make what looks an impossibility into something amazing. And, 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 and I think it was about 10 months later, we had... $100,000. God had multiplied that $10,000. And so now, together with the sale of that building and what, what had been accumulated, we had exactly enough to purchase this building with $5,000 left over. And I look back at that, and, 
and I remind myself, and just recently again, as we were talking about this, we, we reminded ourselves, let's take our focus off of the five loaves and the two fishes. And let's put our focus back on Jesus. Because five loaves and two fishes, together with Jesus, looks a whole lot different than just five loaves and two fishes. And I, and I want to encourage you, as you think about your life, you can't do what God calls you to do. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, you give them something to eat. It was an impossibility. How are they supposed to feed 5,000 men plus women and children? See, often the tasks God gives us are impossible. And the math does not work. And even now, we've started this building addition back here. What's in our bank account does not make sense to complete this building project here. But I believe that if we bring it to Jesus, he can multiply it. He's done it. He has, he has a track record of doing that. Guess what happens when Jesus multiplies it? Who gets the glory? Not us. He does. He gets the glory for it. And guess what happens? People hear about it, and they recognize, oh, I would rather go there. I don't need to go to the villages to buy food. I can go to the master and eat from his table. Our first step should never be to measure our resources. Don't we do that far too often? We, we measure our resources. And all we see is five loaves and two fish. Our first step ought rather to be, is this the Lord's will? Does God want us to do this? And as we've prayed and evaluated, we've come to a conclusion that the educational needs of our children are in line with the will of God. Who says that we ought not to hinder little children from coming to Him, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. We've, we've come to a determination that God cares about the future educational needs of our children. And we've understood that God is telling us these things. We've also come to the conclusion that as the Sunday school is out of room, this can also greatly benefit these, these young Sunday school children that God has blessed us with. You know, we have so many children here. That's a blessing from God. So we can determine, yes, this is the Lord's will. So rather than first measuring our resources, let's ask ourselves, is it the Lord's will? And if it's the Lord's will, our next step is to have total dependence upon Him. We, we bring everything we have. Our, our mind, our will, our emotions, our resources... We bring it all to him, just like Jesus says. Jesus said, bring it to me. Bring it here. We bring it to Jesus, and we say, Jesus, this is an impossibility for me. This is an impossibility for us as a church. That's why we need you. When we add you, the, the sum at the bottom changes drastically. Not only is it a few thousand dollars, and I don't know where to go from here, it's a few thousand dollars plus Jesus. And the whole story changes. Verse 20 says, They all ate, and they were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. And I just... I've just been reminded as I look at this passage that we can pursue the world. We can go to the villages to find food. But that's never going to satisfy us. That's never going to meet our needs. But when we put Jesus into the equation, we get to eat from his table and we can be satisfied. Just like these 
followers here where they were able to eat from his provision. He multiplied the bread, and they ate, and they were satisfied. And I think that as we think about our world today, maybe we're missing out. Maybe we're sending people out to the villages to buy food. And, and we're missing out on the Lord using us to feed them. And I think Jesus would delight if we would take to heart this thought seriously and we would say, God has said to me, you give them something to eat. You need not go away. You need not go away. God has gifted us and given us the opportunity to, to feed the hungry. And we're in a world that needs to see that kind of Jesus. And, and I pray that God would give us that kind of vision. That we would today yet see with the eyes of Jesus. That we would see humanity the way he sees them. And that we would responsibly turn away from self and the inconveniences that come our way, and we would be open to that, and we would be willing to be used by God to feed the hungry as they come seeking. Jesus demonstrated that example to us beautifully. And I think we can learn from that example. In John 6, 33, Jesus said, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The crowd said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You know what? Not only as believers can we feed upon the Lord Jesus and experience this life-giving nourishment. We can do this. We can, we can get our sustenance, our satisfaction and today, if you're sitting here and your life is miserable and you're stressed out and you're living in fear and anxiety and you're, there's not peace inside of you, I wonder if you are feeding at the table of the Lord. These, this crowd could be satisfied. They, their hunger was met. And today, Jesus is still saying to us, this same thought, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Your life can be characterized by, by a life that reveals to a world that here's somebody who's well satisfied. Here's somebody who's feeding at the right places. Wouldn't it be great if people would, would look upon our lives and they would see Jesus written all over them. And they would say, hey, there walks somebody filled with peace. They're not hungry the way the world is. They're finding their satisfaction at the master's table. May that be our experience, that we would eat from the Lord and be satisfied in that we would become a, a conduit for others. That we would just become a channel. That the Holy Spirit could flow through us and we could impact the lives of other people. There's an 18th century hymn that says this, Guide me, O thou great Redeemer, pilgrim through the, this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. May that be our cry as we look for sustenance, as we look for an answer in our life. May we feed from him. And as a result, may the world around us see our lives and want the same thing. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this great illustration in this scripture passage, Lord. 
Father, may we learn from Jesus. May we be more like him. And Father, I just ask that you would bless your people, Lord. Bless them with a, a desire to put the needs of others in front of their own, like Jesus did. Father, bless them with a heavenly compassion, a vision that each one here would be able to see the world around them like Jesus did. Father, bless each person here with the ability to feed those who come their way rather than sending them to the village. Father, bless us in such a way that we would eat from your bread, the living bread, and never be hungry for the things the world offers us anymore. Father, may we sustain ourselves at your table. Lord, as a result, may we bring our gifts to you and allow you to multiply them and make them exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or even think, Lord. You are able, Lord. You are worthy. You are all-powerful, Lord. When we bring everything we have to you, you are able to do more than we can ask or think. Thank you, Jesus. May you bless us in that way, Lord. Lead us by your Spirit. Multiply according to your will. In Jesus' name. Amen.